All right, I'm going to start letting people in. Um, good evening, everyone. We're just admitting everyone right now. Just going to take one more minute to kind of let people come in. Good evening. We're excited that you're all with us tonight. Give us just one more minute. We'll get started. Um, okay. So I think we're just going to go ahead and get started here. Um, um, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, excited uh, that you are all with us here this evening. My name is Jennifer Junkamara Khan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Outreach and Public Engagement Coordinator at Stamps Gallery, which is part of the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all here this evening to the third Envision Conversations with Hamtramck-based artist Kylie Lockwood and Craig Hadley, the Executive Director and Chief Curator at the Dennis Museum Center at Northwestern Michigan College. Envision Conversations is a series of five virtual events presenting insightful conversations between each finalist of Envision and a leading Michigan-based curator. Through this series, audiences will get a chance to hear about the artist's process and ideas that went into creating new and existing work they are presenting in Envision. Each of the events are virtual and includes an artist talk followed by a conversation between the featured artist and curator, which is followed by a public Q&A. Envision conversations are happening in conjunction with the exhibition Envision the Michigan Artists Initiative, which is currently on view at Stamps Gallery. Um, it opened November 12th of 2021 and will run through January 22nd of 2022. Um, Stamps Gallery is open to the public, um, so we invite you all to come and see the exhibition. Stamps Gallery is always free and open to the public. Our galleries are Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Thursday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, so we look forward to having you come visit us. Uh, for more information and details, please visit our Stamps Gallery webpage on the Stamps School of Art and Design website that we will put in the chat for you to check out. Uh, please note this event is being recorded, so if you do not want to be in the recording, turn off your video. Also, please keep yourself on mute throughout the event unless you are speaking. Um, this will just help us with, with the sound. Um, you can also access live captioning using the button on the top of your Zoom window. For those of you who have not been to Stamps Gallery before, uh, we are a professionally run art gallery that functions as an incubator and lab for contemporary artists and designers to explore ideas and projects that catalyze social change. Building on the school's strong tradition of excellence, thought leadership, and community engagement, our goal is to develop innovative and scholarly exhibitions, publications, and public programs that foster inclusive platforms per for presentation, discussion, and inquiry into the urgent questions and concerns of our time. A commitment to social justice shapes our work that we hope inspires new ways of looking, making, and thinking. The gallery is housed in a 6,000 square foot exhibition space located in downtown Ann Arbor. Every year we present two to four student exhibitions and three to five exhibitions with renowned artists and designers working locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and all of our exhibitions are complemented by a number of public programs. Um, this evening, following opening remarks and introductions, Kylie will present her work through an artist talk. This will be followed by the conversation between Kylie and Craig, and then we will open it up to a public Q&A. Feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout the program tonight, but just uh, note we will not take any questions until the public Q&A session starts. And with that, I will turn it over to Stamps Gallery Director Shreemori Mitra to tell us more about Envision and introduce our special guest tonight. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Shreemori Mitra, and I'm the Director of Stamps Gallery. I am, here we go. So first of all, Happy New Year. <laughs> Very happy to be here today to kick off our uh, new year with, this, with the Envision Conversations with Kylie Lockwood and Craig, Had Craig Hadley. Um, so I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging that Stamps Gallery is part of the University of Michigan. 
which, which resides on the traditional territories of the three fires people, the Ojibwe, uh, Odawa, and Bodewadami. As we live, work, and play on these territories, we keep in mind the ongoing effects of colonization, community struggle for self-determination, and the recognition of indigenous sovereignty. So in March 2020, uh, when you know the entire world was closing down uh, with the onset of the pandemic, um, we announced Stamps Gallery uh, announced an open call for emerging to mid and mid career artists living and working in Michigan, uh, practicing in all um, you know in all uh, media. The call for submissions received 200, uh, 259 applications from across the state. Uh, we appointed uh, an accomplished jury comprising um, of um, an artist, curator, and uh, museum um, and museum and collections uh, professional Ken Aptikar, uh, Carla Acevedo Yates, and uh, Loring Randolph, um, respectively, uh, who really did the hard work of reviewing the applications um, and uh, and narrowing, uh, you know, the 259 applications down to five uh, wonderful finalists. Uh, uh, who comprise um, Envision, uh, the, uh, the uh, Michigan Artist Initiative um, exhibition in its inaugural year, um, which opened on November 12th. Um, so the finalists um, of who comprise the exhibition, um, the artists are uh, Nida Colazzo Lorenz, Michael Dixon, Carol Harris, Kylie Lockwood and Daryl D'Angelo Terrell. Um, I want to express my deepest thanks to the artists who have participated in the exhibition for their hard work and rigor in envisioning, um, you know, the new work in the show, um, as well as, uh, of course, the jury uh, for their time and energy and generosity um, in um, in uh, reviewing the applications and narrowing it down uh, to the five finalists. Um, the um, 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 uh, also, uh, I want to express my deepest thanks to uh, our funders and supporters, Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and uh, Michigan Council of Cultural Affairs for their generous support uh, in, uh, in helping us present the exhibition. There is a forthcoming publication and, of course, these series of conversations um, um, that will continue uh, for, till the end of the exhibition. Um, so now it is my deepest honor to introduce our esteemed um, artist and curate and um, and uh, curator um, for the conversation that we're all here for. So I'll start with Craig Hadley, is the ex executive director and chief curator of the Dennis Museum Center at Northwestern Michigan College. The museum features 20,000 square feet of permanent and rotating exhibition space, a children's gallery, and, and one of the largest collections of Inuit art in the United States. Prior to Dennis, Hadley was the, uh, was the director, curator, and assistant professor at Depot University at Greencastle, Indiana for eight years. In addition, he, uh, in addition to Dennis and Depot, Mr. Hadley has worked in, um, in various uh, curatorial education and collection roles at the Beloit College, a Wright Museum uh, of Art, Logan Museum of Anthropology, the Field Museum of Natural History, um, uh, at the at the uh, Indiana State Museum mm -hmm. and Missouri History Museum. Um, he is an active board member at the Association of Academic Museums and Galleries, and his writing has appeared in numerous publications uh, such as the Museum Review, the Museum Magazine, and the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences uh, blog called Up Next. Welcome, Craig. Um, Next, we have Kylie Lockwood. Uh, Kylie Lockwood is an interdisciplinary artist whose work reconciles the experience of living in a female body in the Western history of sculpture. She received her BFA, uh, a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Co uh, College of Creative Studies in Detroit and an MFA from Hunter College in New York and attended the Skowegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Lockwood uh, completed a permanent collection, um, permanent, sorry, permanent uh, public sculpture at the Lewis um, Integrative Science Building at the University of Oregon. She's represented by Simone de Souza Gallery in Detroit, and her work has been exhibited at PS1 MoMA, the Cranbrook Art Museum in Bloomfield Hills, um, 
and Cleopatra's in Brooklyn, uh, as well as the Lord Ludd in Philadelphia, among other venues. Welcome, Kylie. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Jennifer to play her video. In my work, I re-explore art historical poses through the use of my body as sculpture. For Envision, I'm specifically looking at the pose and the sculpture of Michelangelo's Pieta. I'm currently pregnant, and so I'm both delving into that personal subject matter and art historical subject matter um, for multiple reasons. For this sculpture, because this sculpture is so much more of an iconic sculpture, I was actually able to buy postcards and ephemera from this sculpture. One of the things that I'm doing is working with this ephemera and beginning to develop a relationship and explore some of the content and questions that I'm examining myself through these objects. So that's that's where the work begins. Then there's a lot of planning to figure out how I want to go about readdressing these poses. And then much of that work is in pulling casts directly from my body. Then there's a whole stage of mold making. And then through that mold making, I'm then casting sculptures. For me, I mean, one of the best things about being a viewer of art is getting to witness an artist's delving into questions. For me, there's multiple questions that I'm beginning to ask and experiences that I'm exploring through this work. So much of it is delving into unknowns. And so I think that that discovery is um, both as an artist, but then also as a viewer is like, is one of the best things to get to witness um, when you look at work. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Kylie. Great. Right. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. So my exhibition for Envision is entitled Facility. And as I said in my video, um, when I was invited to be part of Envision, I had recently discovered that I'd become pregnant. Um, and the idea of producing a new body of work, I specifically wanted to address that subject matter directly. So that's the personal subject matter that I was bringing to this work. Um, and then I started doing research and thinking about how I would address that personal subject matter or what I would address that personal subject matter through. And I started looking at examples of mothers in art history. And, um, and I specifically you know, started looking at one of the most iconic um, mothers in art history, which is, um, which, and then the sculpture and the position of the Pieta. So um, there's a whole bunch of Pietas. Um, and I was looking at a, bunch of examples of them. I was looking at um, some ones that were carved out of wood. I was looking at um, terracotta ones. And ultimately, um, I decided that I wanted to use Michelangelo's Pieta for multiple reasons. Um, and, for, and to rewind a little bit, so I was pregnant, um, but I wasn't pregnant for the first time. I was actually pregnant with my second child. Um, so although I was uh, although this pregnancy was very different than my first pregnancy, I wasn't stepping into the subjectivity of becoming a mother for the first time. Um, I had, uh, I have a, I at the time I had a child who was over five years old, or sorry, four years old. Um, and so that content was something that I had been building to and had been thinking about how to address and how to find language for. And one of the things in making work, um, as I was orienting myself to the new subjectivity of being a mother is I realized 
that it was such a uh, both complicated subject and, and there were all of these pitfalls and, and contradictions and things that would stick to the subject matter that I, that I couldn't quite like unhook. And so the P Michelangelo's Pieta is such an iconic work and there's, it's so multi-layered. There's so many dimensions to it um, that um, that was one of the reasons that I knew that that was the work I wanted to um, to use and address this and and readdress this this pose and this sculpture by making work through. So I started um, one second. So I started doing research um, on and one of the great things about Michelangelo's Pieta is that there's tons of ephemera, and so I was buying postcards and I bought. Um, press images, and um, I was looking through a, um, oh. so I, and then I came across this, um, and I saw an image of this head and realized that it was an excellent replica of the sculpture, and um, I actually saw it on a state sale for a church that was closing, um, and so uh, I went looking for it on eBay and found a copy of it. Um, and I purchased the head and when it arrived, um, I saw the back for the first time. And on the back is the label of how this object was produced. Um, and there's also a date and inscription. And so these two elements really in ignited um, what I knew I wanted to do with this work. Um, so I'm going to start with the inscription. So on the right hand side, you can see an inscription, um, which is copyright 1982 MMA. Um, and so this copy was produced um, the same year that I was conceived. So this copy has existed in this configuration for as long as I've existed in this configuration. Um, and so that personal content was particularly exciting for me to develop and work with this object. Um, and then the second thing is that in reading the description and the label of, of what this object is and where it came from, um, not only did I pull the title of the exhibition, facsimile from here, but um, the label explicitly says that the Metropolitan Museum of Art produced this through direct impression molds of the original sculpture developed by the Department of Scientific Research of the Vatican Museums. So the other thing that's significant about 1982 is that it's 10 years after the sculpture was attacked, after the Pieta was attacked by Laszlo Tuff and he took a hammer and um, got up on the sculpture and proceeded to knock its arm and hand off and then bits of the face um, and attempted, you can see here, to almost, um, like to, de you know, to, to behead the sculpture, but was not successful. He was apprehended um, before that happened, but not before he was able to do a considerable amount of damage. Um, and so this sculpture went through a trauma. Um, and you can see here in this uh, press photo image, which I purchased off eBay, um, you can see them assessing the face and beginning to figure out how they're going to deal with this and repair this. And so one of the ways they began to, um, to figure that out and to work with that was from making molds off the sculpture. Um, and this was particularly exciting for me um, because here is an example of a replica, a copy, a repetition, a reproduction that's made not to have a not not just to purely have another one or have a lesser version of the sculpture that more people could put on their shelves, but making a copy, making a mold of this sculpture's body in attempt to repair an attempt to heal um, and reconfigure things that had been damaged and the trauma that the sculpture had gone through. And so for me, that was extremely potent. Mold making is something that is not just a process for me, um, is extremely 
um, powerful and extremely personally connected um, for me. Uh, my grandmother was a porcelain doll maker and my grandmother is the first person who taught me how to make a mold. And so when I'm making a mold, I'm not only replicating a form, I'm engaging in a process that was handed down to me by my maternal grandmother. And so I'm also engaging in an act of repli replication um, by someone who I am a replica of, in a sense. Um, so that that was um, so that was my my the place where the work really took off. So in addition to casting casting my pregnant torso, I began working with this head, this disembodied head, this um, this head that got separated from its torso that got separated from the rest of its figure. And I got excited by that disorientation and I started attempting to relate to it through pairing it with my torso, with my figure, um, with my body, the head of one mother with the torso of another. And so I started while I was getting ready and producing um, the work for the sculpture that you'll see at the end of this slide, I was also producing these photographs. Um, and in these photographs, I wanted to, I wanted to work and establish and attempt to position myself in this head, in the tones and in the space and in the spectrum of experiences that I was having um, being pregnant for the second time. Um, and so uh, the titles of these photographs are very practical and pragmatic and descriptive um, because although these images uh, are of disorientation and the spectacular, the spectacle here, my body and the head are um, pressed between the sky and the sky's reflection on a large mirror. Um, but it also is just purely a pregnant torso with the head of the Pieta against mirror and sky. I wanted to be able to also talk about, you know, things that were dark, things that were suspenseful. Um, I wanted to capture lightness. I wanted to capture the waiting. I wanted to capture something absurd, something even funny, um, and also orient myself in this and try to pair myself in this head in many different ways, shift our joining. I also wanted to talk about the rupture. I wanted to talk about the sharp. I wanted to talk about the break. I wanted to talk about the trauma. And again, attempting to do this with pretty simple means with my body, the head, mirrors, and the space that I had around me. And then while I was producing these photographs, I had my own break, my own um, experience of trauma and all of those things. And I gave birth to my second child. Um, and so I continued making these photographs and orienting my torso with this head. Um, and so I also wanted to talk, this, um, this piece is entitled Postpartum Torso with Head of the Pieta. And I wanted to talk about and capture the after, the recovery, the horizontality, the extreme horizontality, the foreshortening, the shifting of perspective, perspective, you know, the rest, the repair. This is postpartum extremities with the head of the Pieta. And then I also wanted to capture, again, in thinking about copy, in thinking about replication, in thinking about reproduction, in thinking about producing another. Um, I wanted to capture that repetition. I wanted to show repeating oneself and a new disorientation, a new absurd. Um, this is postpartum torso with the head of the Pieta doubled. 
So those are a section, um, a selection of the photographs that are in the show. Um, and this is the sculpture that's in the show. Um, it's titled Abbreviated Pieta. Um, and it consists of 1300 pounds of unfired clay, resin, epoxy, Carrara marble, and facsimile copy of the head of Michelangelo's Pieta. So I produced, so there are two, there are three aspects of this sculpture. Um, there's a cast, a negative cast of my pregnant torso. Um, there is a additional copy of the head of the Pieta embedded into the surface of the clay. And then there is the 1300 pounds of unfired clay that I modeled and configured and produced on site um, for the exhibition over three days. Um, and I formed it in the shape and the base of the Pieta, um, the base of the Pieta if the two figures weren't present. So um, these are some images of the process of producing this work. Um, you can see building the, the sculpture on the left. And then on the right, I'm placing the cast of my, of my stomach and my torso into the part of the sculpture that is actually forms the base, or the, not the base, the bench, um, where Mary sits. Um, and this is a uh, detail of the sculpture when it's finished. Um, so the clay is wet. Um, and I kept the clay covered. Once it was finished, I kept it covered to the opening. And then once the opening happened, I uncovered the clay and it began drying. Um, so here you can see um, the, the, the cast of my stomach and the head of the pieta, which is planted, face planted into the sculpture um, and into the base and is where Mary would have had one of her feet. Um, so there are still, in a sense, two figures in this sculpture in the space, but instead of residing on the base, they're inside the base. Um, they're embedded into the base. Um, and then what starts to happen is that this clay starts to dry. Um, the physics of this clay begins to enact um, and it begins to contract. Um, and as the clay contracts, it puts pressure on the components um, that are inside and embedded in the clay. And I, I had, and I had an, I, I had an idea of what the sculpture might do. Um, the negative cast of my stomach is almost like like a shell, like an eggshell. Um, so I had a sense that it could crack it, um, and I knew that it might propel the head up. Um, but so much of it is unknown. Um, I didn't know exactly what would happen. Um, and so then after a few weeks, um, this is what the sculpture looks like. Um, and I was excited to see that the cast retained its form and actually held up extremely well. And that the embedded head actually split the entire base, this in the, the 1300 pounds of clay is cracked and separated completely at its center. Um, you can see here this crack starting at the beginning, um, going up into the head and that crack continues and multiple cracks continue to the back of the sculpture. So I was really excited that this and, and What's particularly potent about this sculpture is, is it had its own division, it had its own separation, it had its own, own rupture. Um, here you can see that more closely. Okay, and that's a good, that's a good spot to stop. Excellent. Thank you, Kylie, for that incredible talk. And so um, now I will bring on um, uh, Kylie and Craig, if you can unmute yourself and ask you guys to start your conversation. Thanks.
Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, thanks, Kylie, for your presentation. We, uh, we had an opportunity to chat last week for a little bit and for us to get to know each other. Um, but what's so exciting about your presentation is I, I learned so much more, even as I continue to dive deeper into your work. So um, I just want to thank you again for, for creating the body of work that you did and, and for installing it uh, for the public. Oh, thank you, Craig. So, you know, I figured I'd, I'd get us started just, um, you know, sort of warm up and dive into a few things. Um, I think one starting with the sort of general installation itself, and then we'll, we'll work a bit into the, the work uh, that you discussed. But I wanted to start first with this question about the program itself, right? The, the sort of envision fellowship uh, that you're able to take, uh, sort of per participate in. But what opportunities did the Envision uh, Michigan Artists Initiative uh, bring to you? So I guess let's let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, um, working with Shimori, Jennifer, Joe, and the rest of the team at Stamps was incredible. And when one has the opportunity to work with an institution that's so supportive, um, it's extremely special. Um, and so that in itself. Um, and being and having the opportunity to produce this work and show it is is a really wonderful opportunity. But secondly, the show is unique, at least in, in my experience of showing, in that it's a group show of solo shows. And the only time I've had the opportunity to do that is at when I've during my thesis show, both in undergrad and graduate school. And it was such a wonderful experience to be producing this body of work, to be, you know, there's a, there's a caliber and there's a push that an artist um, aspires to and really pushes themselves in producing a solo show. So getting to do that um, with four other artists was really wonderful. And also um, arriving and getting to see that the work they had been making over almost a year was was really an incredible experience. So that was um, really invaluable. Yeah, and in so many ways, it's it's this shared experience, right? I mean, you yeah. are in many ways, you're, you're a cohort that got to work together and, and sort of grow together in your practice. And so I, I would imagine that relationship is, is pretty special. Um, sort of connected to that, um, you know, any impact on sort of the future trajectory of your work kind of, you know what what you're thinking maybe next now that you can use this either as a as a springboard or maybe just you know it's like version one and now you're thinking about okay what does version 2.0 look like absolutely so um when i started working on this body of work um i started thinking about reproducing the pose of the pieta and producing the entire sculpture um that was not feasible in the time and, and what I had going on in my life. Um, but I made the casts. In making the cast for this sculpture, I also produced multiple other casts and photographs during this time that I'm going, that will be, um, that's at least two other shows. Um, so, so this has been a really potent space for me. And um, this absolutely is the, the first iteration. And this show is specifically, about my dialogue with this sculpture and that head specifically, this, this copy. Um, so later iterations will address the sculpture in large and the subject matter at large. Did, um, did seeing your work on display, um, and, and I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, where <laughs> really I wanna talk about an artist's relationship with their work, both in the studio, which is such an intimate space. Um, and I mean, in some ways could almost be considered sort of like a sacred or, or private space. Um, and for me as a curator, it's always um, such an honor, right? To be admitted into an, an artist's studio and to see work in progress, to have discussion or conversation about works that maybe didn't work or maybe you know ended up in an artist's eyes being, being a failure. Um, or maybe just not working out. Um, but how would you say seeing the work that you created on display now, how has that changed your relationship with the work that you created for the show? Oh, it- I guess it, versus, it, yeah. versus when you were working in the studio. 
Yeah, I'm putting together the exhibition really allows you to focus. Um, and so, and, and also, you know, you get to, uh, and this is, this is probably very apparent by the video that was produced um, for this exhibition. Um, you know, you can see in my sculpture there, or in my sculpture, in my studio, <laughs> in my studio, there's, um, there's a lot going on. Um, and, you know, in your studio, you, you kind of have the full terrain of, of all of the possibilities and you're kind of like, so embedded in things, it's difficult to even sometimes see what you're doing. Um, and so putting both, both in constructing and conceiving of an exhibition that is an edit, um, that is a portion of something, mm -hmm. but then also getting the sense to figure out what is included, what's not included. Um, I was producing, or I have produced a, um, quite a large, body of work that then I had to figure out what part of that body of the work, work would be this show. So, um, and then also, like I said, there, there was the conceiving of this, the sculpture and um, walking in and seeing, I, I wasn't in the gallery as it was drying. Um, and I'm glad that I didn't get to see the steps because walking in and seeing that the entire sculpture had cracked in half, um, that that head had kind of served as a, um, oh shoot, what's the term? Like a like a wedge sort of? Wedge to split yeah. it was was um, was not something I could fully anticipate and was very exciting. What's really interesting, or at least what sort of caught my eye when I watched the presentation I was listening to this, this time, um, thinking about the head, not just as a wedge, but also in many ways, I mean, it, it is sort of like that mending plate. It is that, it is that bridge that is holding the two halves in many ways together still. So, I mean, it's, there is this sort of, um, you know, there is a lot of tension in, on lots of different levels, as you mentioned with the work expanding and contracting and drying. Um, but it, it's just interesting to think about that as something that is both sort of on one hand helping, but maybe also hindering or, you know, creating that, that fissure as you referenced. Yeah, I think about that with the attack of the P.A. Mm -hmm. and the fact that, I mean, in one case it's very traumatic and very violent, but also Lazo Tov took a hammer and, which is the tool that was used to create the Pieta, mm -hmm. right? And so it's the, and and so it's a, so I think that that's also interesting. This this like this duality and like turning something over. Um, and also with that head, it was really important that I that I was embedding. I, I wanted to flatten out the head. I wanted to do something. Um, I wanted to face plant it, but I also wanted to put it inside. Um, and so there's something. I think that that gesture of seamlessly fusing the head with the clay and the base of the sculpture in a sense. So there's a few different things there. One, it's an offering of giving the head, giving the head back to the sculpture. Two, it's violent. Um, it's being pressed into something. It's being face planted. Three, there's sort of an absurdity to it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also a flattening out. It, prioritizes the label, it prioritizes the back, um, which for me is really important um, in that object. Right, and I think particularly for a visitor who, who might encounter your work for the first time, right? And then there's so many questions and there's so much um, that sort of bubbles up based on the context of that label, um, but also the fact that that, that information and the way in which it was sort of authorized, right, as, you know, here is an official copy, right, that, that is to be used, um, uh, brings all sorts of, uh, you know, implied meaning with it. Yeah. I, I know we don't have a lot of time left, really, <laughs> before we, we sort of get into Q&A uh, with audience members. I, I want to spend some time talking about this idea of authenticity and the authentic, and it's a conversation that I think in the art world and museum world, for that matter, right, this has been going on 
for as long as artists have created and as long as museums have existed really as, as repositories of the authentic and the real. Um, so I thought, you know, it'd be nice if we could spend maybe five minutes just talking about, again, that, that process for you in sort of acquiring different types of ephemera. You know, I was thinking during your presentation, I know the copy in which you acquired the copy in which you acquired for this work, you know, both in terms of the date in which it was created, but also the context, um, bear significant personal meaning. But are there other types of copy, other types of ephemera that could confer, um, you know, an authentic sort of experience for you or an authenticity mm -hmm. that could also work? For example, um, thinking about, you know, virtual reality, 3D printed objects, like other types of facsimile or replica, which could be created in different ways, but yeah. may not be these direct sort of molds. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that I, uh, that I have the most direct relationship with and that I've worked with before, um, so in 2000, 15, I collaborated, 2015, 2016, I collaborated with a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Oregon. Um, and so their lab was looking at how context affects perception. And one of the things that I did while I was there producing work is I got to participate, um, I got to participate in a study, uh, uh, an, a functioning M MRI study, on, on memory. And I participated in the study um, and, they were, and I would, they were actually able to give me, one of the agreements in me participating in the study was that I'd be able to get the high-res scan of my head. Um, so, I, I, so I think that one, okay, so, so one, in terms of other relationships, I, in that, I was able actually to harvest the data. Here, I'm doing a project thinking about the mind, thinking about how, you know, how do you visualize it? And then in the test, I was able to, you know, I'm thinking, how do I relate? And then there they were making casts, they were making copies, right. they were making yeah. 3D sculptures of the mind to, to then also look at the mind and conceive of it. And, um, and so th that was, uh, I, I was surprised at the amount of things that I was doing in my, um, in my studio that had relevance to the way they were conceiving of their studies. And so, so one, um, I have a, thinking back to, am I answering your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so one, that makes me think about that, but two, I also think, you know, making a copy, making a photograph, making a cast, making, you know, making a replica, even in the history of doc, even, so this is one within personal life and two within art history, making a copy is an attempt of preservation. It's an mm -hmm. attempt to stop time. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in that or to hedge off or not hedge off, but like attempt to hold on to something that's shifting and moving. Um, and that for me is, is really potent and important. Yeah, I, and, and I also think too, you know, particularly on the museum side of things, right? I mean, we're, all, we're always so very sensitive about, well, is it, is it authentic? Is this an original executed by artist XYZ? Or are we dealing with a copy, a fake, a forgery, a facsimile, right? I mean, lots of different, um, as soon as we walk into a museum and we encounter something that says replica, often, you know, for many of us, I think our attention, our, the value that we're assigning to that experience suddenly changes within, within an instant. Um, I think for me, what's so fascinating about your work in particular with thinking about facsimile that has, for example, career marble that's sort of crushed and embedded, even though there is sort of like plastic polymer resin integrated into that piece, right? There's, there's this tiny little bit of, of the old world, like the authentic that's embedded in there, um, yet it's still a copy, right? So I know we could talk about this probably for the next hour, um, 
but but I want to give us a few more minutes here um, before we move on to the Q and A. So one thing I'm always so curious about, um, particularly with with artists, academics, um, how how does your how does your reading and your research, the things that you're working on right now, how does that inform um, sort of new bodies of work and in, in what you're what you're working on next? So is there something that is sort of at the top of your uh, reading pile right now, and you're thinking there could be a kernel, there could be a seed here um, that really could you know, be the beginnings of, of my next show. Yeah. Um, so, I uh, in doing some research recently, um, I came across, uh, Julie Kristeva's work on severed heads. So I'm actually, um, just starting to read that and thinking about, um, because I have, I mean, I just referenced, um, I have all of these, actually you can see, there's one oh, right sure. here in my studio. Um, I've created a binaural audio head um, that makes binaural audio recordings that have the microphones embedded in the ears. Um, and so I've been thinking about so 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 get so so I think I think research and working, there's something about you know, you move the work forward and then you find and then the and then there you find something and then that moves you forward. So there's this like right that happens, um, which is really incredible. And also the, so in researching the Pieta and, and attempting, before I got the head, I was trying to find, uh, find out if it was cast directly from the, from the Pieta. And, that, and then I found a ton of images, like that one image of the plaster cast, but also the images of how they repaired the sculpture and the ways in which I don't have them on my slides, so I can't show them to you right now, but the ways in which they're propping up this sculpture and inventing and inventing scenarios to repair and um, place this sculpture in a way to be repaired um, is very similar to the ways in which I'm setting up things to place my body into a pose to cast. So there's there's a whole vernacular of the in those photographs and in my studio that I'm interested in exploring also. Um, that, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think about your research in particular with acquiring some of the ephemera and really, I mean, some some primary documentation, secondary documentation? Do you think about that as sort of like building your own archive of sorts? And, oh yeah. Um, I, I guess you know what for you might happen to some of that someday? Is there, um, is that work that you think you'll hang on to? Will you try to hmm. roll that into some sort of archival project at some point? Yeah, I think, I mean, artist archives are uh, really potent spaces. So I think there's also, yeah, like I, I feel like that's a, that's a really interesting curatorial exploration. Sure. Um, and yeah, it definitely could be. I mean, the um, the images, I mean, I have a whole section of research on the hand um, that got severed and got, got um, had gotten broken. Um, mm -hmm. And so that in itself is another, is another like branch that I may go down. Well, thank you, Kylie. I know we're I know we're at our, our time just about. So I, I want to hand things back over, I think, um, for our moderator, right, Jennifer? Yep. That'd be great. But great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. And all those um, very interesting questions and wonderful responses. Um, so now let's open it up to our public Q and A. So if folks want to go ahead and and put questions um, in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do that. Um, I can go ahead and and maybe um, kick us off with a question. Um, that I have, Kylie. Um, and, you know, so, well, one thing too, and I, I, I have to say, it, during your um, talk, I love the way that you um, just use like words, it was almost like poetry and performance. And as I was thinking about this question, um, performance, you know, I didn't, I haven't always thought about 
uh, maybe specifically performance with your work, but it's definitely there, even sort of when you're you're talking about your work. And, and I thought that was really um, incredible that you added that into um, your presentation. So thank you for that. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the intersection of um, photography um, and sculpture and performance in your work and and wondering sort of along that line, you know, does one inform the other, um, you know, does one come first, I guess, thinking a little bit about sort of your process too, or um, yeah, I'll just put that out there. Yeah, they, all three tend to happen um, interchangeably and there's not always one that happens first. Um, because, and then also, I mean, in that way, like performance in my work, you know, the, my work is performative and, um, also the performative is, is there's the performance, there's the holding of the pose. So much of making the work is also performing work. So, um, so in a sense, um, maybe the, the, you know, performance and actions and having these loaded or, um, hmm. I would say that, that, you know, sculpture and photography can be separate, but also, you know, so many of my photographs come from making the, the sculpture and also, um, you know, in my photographs are sculptures. Um, I think it's more about, um, I was thinking about, it's more about what the medium gives you the opportunity to, um, to do and to show the viewer. So photography, is this really specific lens. Um, and I can, and I can just like, when I went through the photographs, you know, I can shift the tone and you have a lot of control of what's seen and what's not seen. Um, and then the sculptures, there's this physicality, there's this confrontation with this real thing um, in space. Um, and then also, you know, there's the time. And so the performance is often embedded in the sculpture and embedded in the photography, but then also the work performs. Um, the sculpture at, at Stamps was performing very slowly, um, you know, over four weeks. Um, and so, so uh, I guess maybe they're, they're, it's difficult to, to, they aren't separate. They're, it's hard to unhinge one from the other. Excellent. Interesting. And, you know, actually, too, also when you were talking and a word that I wrote down um, as well during your talk or yeah, when you were giving your presentation was improvisation, too, mm -hmm. like as you had to, you know, like your practice being um, very much about <laughs> improvisation as you had to for this exhibition too, kind of like working on the fly, you know, having to sort of like change things. And I just, yeah, that was Absolutely. kind of like, yeah, interesting. Um, great, thank you for that response. Um, so, um, okay, what is, so how about, can I ask you this? What, uh, what is, uh, what are you working on next or what are you, I guess you kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the, the research and that you were kind of doing and that you had discovered and that you were reading, but um, do you have some ideas for, yeah, what, what's up next? Yeah, so actually, um... When the video was produced, uh, one of the shots that they took is of my whiteboard, um, and so and I'm and I'm looking at my whiteboard right now, but it's also in the the video. And so when, you know, one of the things I didn't show you guys, um, it was the process photos and and the work of me actually casting my body and my torso, um, because that's building to another body of work. And so actually, if you go back into that um, video, there's like kind of four sections. And so on that whiteboard, I have the Pieta, I have this, um, uh, this sculpture that deals with breastfeeding. And then I also have this anatomical sculpture. And so 
those are some loose outlines of work that, and I don't, I don't know what it will be in the end, but that's where I'm aiming. Um, so, uh, so that will be, so, so that's, um, that's what I'm going to be working on. Excellent. Cool. Thanks. So I think um, there were some folks who mentioned that maybe they had a question. Um, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, Andy, sure. Did you? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm sad that I did not see, I've not seen the show yet, but I'm glad to know that the you know, the closing date is like a week later than I thought it was. So I can definitely check it out when I'm on campus next week. Um, I've always been a big fan of your work, Kylie. And, um, oh, thanks. And one of the things I'm excited about is your direct acknowledgement of sort of art history, whether it's sort of classical or sort of pre-classical and like super ancient, um, kind of almost even like cycladic, kind of chunky, weird sculptures. And I'm, and I, I definitely get a vibe of like the abject and kind of the sort of a sense of formlessness, but it, but is formlessness that is informed by literal direct action on your part. And um, I'm teaching a digital sculpture class this semester. And today we were talking about the history of sculpture and the ways that um, male artists have sort of invoked female bodies for like metaphor. And so I think the thing I'm curious about just to hear you talk more about, it's maybe more of a comment, sorry, uh, of, of the notion of you as a, as a female artist and sort of asserting your own body in these ways that, yes, are explicitly metaphor for sure, but are also, as you say, sort of very visceral and like can't be avoided. So having the cast of your body, sort of um, your, your belly inside the sort of um, big plinth or pile of clay and then having the the Mary's face, like the woman's face is not visible, but then it becomes this like, because of that object, it, it creates such a ripple effect throughout the material. So I don't know if you want to, are you able to talk a little bit more about your relationship to like the abject and the notion yeah. of form and formlessness and what's recognizable? I, the, that last part, feels separate from what you were what you were saying earlier. So sure. You you can part. you can ignore that for sure. Um, yeah. Because that's the actually, answer is this however love, you want. Um Eve Allen Bois book on formlessness is one of my favorite books that I have in my possession. Um but uh but in terms of so one of the things that the and one of the reasons I chose the Pieta is its problematic relationship with the female with the female form it's depicting um with the idealization um uh, with the, so, so both like, you know, Mary, Mary is holding her adult son. She's approximately the same age as his son. So, so there's, there's this idealization of age, the virgin birth, you know, even the scale, there's all of these impossibilities that are, that are happening in the sculpture, let alone the fact that this is not only something within art history, but also something within religion. This is an important object within the Christian faith and Catholicism. And then that whole institution's relationship to women's bodies and that problematic um, subject matter is there. And so one of the things that, and that was why it was important for me to say that this was my second pregnancy, because one of the things that it, after my first pregnancy is I was just shocked in so many ways. And I didn't, and, and so one of the things going back to the specific depiction of women and the depiction, the idealization of the mother in that sculpture, I didn't realize afterwards or stepping into that subjectivity myself, I didn't realize how much, or I was confronted by um, so much internalized misogyny and idealizations that I had bought into myself. And so I was, so I, so when it was sticking to the subject matter that, and the subjectivity that I found myself in, and I, so, so for me, that's really important. And that's one of the reasons, um, 
And, and Craig, this is maybe going back to when you talked about authenticity. This is for me how I'm able to be the most authentic with my experience is to talk up rather than just talk directly about my experience, but talk about it through these art historical, um, art historical sculptures and objects and images because they have, they carry baggage. Um, and that baggage is, is part of what I'm experiencing and I'm exploring. And, um, you know, and then even going through the experience of birth, it's beautiful and it's, and it's extremely traumatic. And those things are inseparable from each other. And so how do you deal with that? Um, and so this is me attempting to begin to deal with that. Thank you, Andy. Excellent. And so, oh, man, I know it's like hard to stop, but we're right at the, we're a little even past seven o'clock. So I think we may actually um, just just take this moment to um, wrap up. But yeah, what a thanks, Andy T, for that question. And yeah, great, great um, responses, Kylie. Um, so I just want to thank you all again. I just wanted to actually share my screen really quickly um, so that I can invite you to um, the next event that we have coming up, which is actually, um, oops, which is actually happening tomorrow, Wednesday, January 12th um, at 6 p.m. again from 6 to 7. Um, our fourth Envision Conversations, which will be with Detroit-based artist Carol Harris and um, Rahima Barbara, um, Barbara Williams, the chief curator at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Um, tomorrow, um, you can uh, register for that event. Thank you so much, Kylie. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, Thank yeah, you. For this, it was yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, incredible presentation and conversation. And yeah, thank you all so much for coming um, this evening for the event. So take care. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Kylie. Thanks, Craig. Mm -hmm.